Hello and welcome to the Lyle Shelton Show. It's great to have your company. I'm coming today from The Good Source, a, a safe place for conservatives and hopefully a challenging space for those who think socialism, Marxism and identity politics should rule the day. I'll be talking to Good Source founder Dave Pillow about this exciting new venture, which I'm really proud to be a part of, and what it means for the battle against fake news. Many of you will have heard of the courageous Bernard Gaynor and his legal travails at the hands of the gay activist Gary Burns, a serial vexatious complainant against Gaynor for his stands on marriage and gender and sexual morality. Well, the big news is that Gary Burns has gone bankrupt. Uh, Bernie has written to his supporters advising them of that news. And while this is a blow to Burns' use of the anti-discrimination legal apparatus to persecute good people, it's not necessarily the end of the end of the road for, for Bernie. And I'll be talking to him a little later in the show. But first, I'm facing my own legal battles. I'm being dragged before a government commission for writing a blog about why drag queens are not good role models for children. I'd hoped this day would not come, but it has. Last month, I received a letter from the government. The Queensland Human Rights Commission is demanding that I appear before it for a conciliation with a couple of aggrieved drag queens. A blog post I wrote in January uh, about the dangers of putting LGBTIQA plus drag queens in front of children has triggered action against me under the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Act of 1991. Under the law, it is compulsory that I turn up. If I don't, I could be forced by court order. If I still refuse, I could go to jail. If I do turn up and refuse to apologize for my article or retract it or redact some of it, I could end up in front of the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. If I lose there, I could be fined. If I refuse to pay the fine in protest against a judgment which impinges on the precious human right of free speech, I could be sent to jail and have a criminal record against my name. But before I had even been served papers from the commission, one of the drag queens, Johnny Valkyrie, took to Twitter to announce that the Queensland Human Rights Commission had already decreed me guilty and that I must turn myself in. I kid you not. Now that sounds like a good title for a book, but I digress, although the first chapter of the sequel uh, may well be being written now. Now Valkyrie was frustrated with me because my address, my home address, is suppressed. And the Queensland Human Rights Commission was not able to easily find me. I make no apology for that. I have a suppressed address for safety reasons after my office was bombed by a same-sex marriage activist in December 2016. You might remember the infamous Australian Christian lobby bombing. Following that incident, a prominent rainbow political activist, Michael Barnett, placed my home address on the internet uh, as a way to try and intimidate me and my family. Now, Johnny Valkyrie is a woman who presents as a man. She tweeted that the Queensland Human Rights Commission had already deemed my article to be vilification under the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Law of 1991. In her tweet, she asserted that I had said she was, quote, dangerous for children. Now, that's not true, and you can read the blog from January for yourself. I objected to Johnny being placed in front of children as a role model because Johnny represents and celebrates the idea that gender is fluid, a dangerous idea to sow into the minds of children. The second drag queen to join with Johnny in taking me to the QHRC goes by the name of Diamond Goodrim. Goodrim is a reference to homosexual sex uh, and homosexual sex acts. Uh, he is also involved as an adult entertainer in the sex trade. It would be obvious to the overwhelming majority of mainstream Australians that Valkyrie and Goodrim are not role models that most parents would want placed in front of their children. Incidentally, Goodrim was a special guest at a Queensland Labor Party function at Parliament House uh, in the last couple of years. At the least, this showed poor taste by Queensland Labor which should be focused on getting the state's economy out of the 
COVID doldrums that Labor created and which is now worse post-COVID. Now, I bear no ill will towards Valkyrie or Goodrum. Uh, they are human creatures like me, created in the image and likeness of God. They have dignity as people, as we all do. We're all equal before God, but not all public policy ideas are equal. And these should be contested and debated in a free and open society using blogs if necessary. A tragic event prompted me to write about Johnny Valkyrie and Diamond Goodridden. In January, members of the University of Queensland Liberal National Club, whose patron is the LNP member for Ujuru, Dr Mark Robinson, a good friend of mine, uh, these young people conducted a peaceful protest at a drag queen story time event being held at one of the Brisbane City Council's public libraries. Drag queens are not for kids. They calmly but firmly chanted. There was no yelling or abuse by the young Liberals. Uh, nothing of the sort was picked up uh, by any of the mobile phone audio or footage that was later released publicly. In the hours immediately after the protest, the group's leader, Wilson Gavin, himself a gay man, was subject to the most vile avalanche of online trolling and abuse by homosexuals and leftists. Uh, some very prominent leftists piled on uh, in this online Twitter storm. Early the next morning, Wilson threw himself under a train at the Chelmer railway station in Brisbane's inner west. While I did not know Wilson, I knew some of his fellow protests and in solidarity with them, I attended Wilson's funeral at Clifton on the Darling Downs uh, the next week. It was unspeakably sad. Wilson and his mates did the right thing. They were brave. They never should have had to try and stop sexualized drag queens and drag culture being normalized to children. That this is happening is a failure of political leadership. It is further capitulation to the relentless march of the aggressive rainbow political movement. Behind that aggression is the law and kangaroo courts like the Queensland Human Rights Commission. Valkyrie and Goodwin are getting legal advice from the taxpayer-funded LGBTI legal service. This service received an eye-watering $400,000 of taxpayers' money in the last three financial years. There is no equivalent taxpayer-funded legal service for mainstream Australians. I'm being advised by the Human Rights Law Alliance, which gets no public money. If mainstream Australians knew that their tax dollars were funding the suppression of reasonable free speech, they would be aghast. Drag queens and what they represent are not for kids. They are dangerous role models and they should not be provided a place in front of children in public libraries. Even though I face this new pressure to be silent, I will not be apologising. I will not be amending my blog and I will not be taking my blog post down. Well, welcome back to The Lyle Shelton Show. My guest now is someone who will be uh, very familiar to many of you, and that's Bernie Gaynor. He's fought a pitch legal battle for years and years against vexatious complaints being brought by a gay activist from New South Wales. Uh, Bernie is a resident of Queensland. And there's been some big news that's broken uh, in Bernie's world over the last few days. And he's joining me now to talk to us about it. Uh, Bernie, welcome to the Lyle Shelton Show. G'day, Lyle. It's a pleasure to be here. Mate, really appreciate your time. Um, you've written on your blog uh, this in these past few days, and, and I'll quote from it. In mid-2015, I faced being hit with over $1 million in fines and the prospect that if I ever spoke about marriage, family, or morality again, that I would face jail for contempt of court. Uh, Bernie, things have moved on since that. Um, what, what's the latest? Well, the latest is that the complainants against me, a serial complainants under the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act, um, by the name of Gary Burns, has gone bankrupt for mm. failing to pay his court costs to myself and a Victorian grandmother, Tess Corbett. Uh, and this is big news because uh, it will certainly put 
a spanner, a big spanner in the works for his remaining complaints. He's got 37 complaints against me. There are four left. Uh, up 33 others have been dismissed uh, or withdrawn. Um, this will probably, well, I don't want to preempt it, but it will probably um, result in these other four complaints being dismissed as well. But it's it's big news because it is a big turnaround in this case. And it is true. Back in 2015, uh, I was facing over a million dollars in fines. Each complaint carries a potential fine of $100,000. And uh, Gary Burns was riding high. He had He's been lodging complaints for almost two decades, but this is really the first time that he has faced opposition. Most people tend to get very nervous, which I understand when they get hit with a complaint from an LGBT activist and they try and settle. Uh, this is the first time he's really faced any opposition. And it's also a massive victory against the anti-discrimination system in New South Wales as well. Not just this bankruptcy, but all the other things that have gone on with it. So um, as bizarre as it sounds, in the 37 complaints lodged against me, not a single uh, finding has been made against me. Yeah, that's but the extraordinary has... thing, isn't it, Bernie? Um, you have not been found guilty of anything through this whole protracted process. And yet you've had to shell out, you know, lots of money for lawyers, uh, go through a lot of personal grief and anguish. It's put your family through a lot of stress. You, you've lost personal income defending yourself. And, and yet you've never been found guilty. And now it looks like uh, Gary Burns is coming to the end of the road, having dragged you through hell. Uh, yeah, well, absolutely. And I think it shows that when we do fight back, conservatives mm -hmm. can win. So I, I just put the only people who have been found to have broken the law in this farcical seven-year saga, which has cost me approximately $400,000 now, I mean, soon wow. there's still bills, will be over $400,000 uh, well over so what it's cost you personally, Bernard? I mean, people have been very generous in, in helping fund some of your case, but um, you've also uh, faced a considerable personal cost as well, notwithstanding the generosity of, of people helping through crowdfunding. Uh, yeah, well, we sold our home in 20, uh, late 2017 or late 2018. We had to sell our home. Um, so we basically have no assets left. Um, so it, and it's, wow. it costs yeah, a, a lot. But um, the, uh, the, the point I want to make, the only people to have been found to have broken the law in this farcical seven-year saga work in the anti-discrimination industry, they were pursuing me um, contrary to the provisions of the Constitution of this nation. Uh, that finding was made both by the uh, Court of Appeal in New South Wales and the High Court of Australia. And I also have a letter in writing where the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board admits in other ways it has failed to meet their statutory obligations under the Anti-Discrimination Act. So they've admitted that they haven't done what they're supposed to do under the Act. At the same time, they're trying to drag me through seven years of hell, I guess you could say, uh, for complaints that have got no merit whatsoever. Have you ever been awarded any court costs yourself? Bernie, as a result of uh, you know, the fact that you haven't been found guilty of anything, I know there's still, you know, I think you said four complaints still outstanding, but of all these 30-odd complaints, ha have you ever been awarded costs for what you've been taken through as a result of this vexatious litigation by Gary Burns? Uh, yes, I have. So that's why Gary Burns is bankrupt. Uh, he had costs awarded against him for the matter that went to the High Court. Uh, he's refused to pay those costs. Um, so that means, you, that means you're, you're out of pocket, uh, essentially. You and your lawyers are out of pocket because he's refused. Yeah, to absolutely. Pay. So mm -hmm. I've, I've um, already paid a large part of those legal fees. So, mm -hmm. um, But also the state of New South Wales and the New South Wales Attorney General have had cost orders awarded against them, in both in the High Court and in the... Um, the Court of Appeal in New South Wales and the state of New South Wales and Attorney General was effectively backing Gary Burns. Um, so they've had to pay costs as well. Uh, and the, 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 the outrageous thing is that Burns has been arguing now that he should not have to pay his costs 
and the state of New South Wales should pay his cost. So we have yeah. Alex Greenwich, the yeah. MP. The, yeah, I, uh, saw, I saw that uh, on your blog post, the, the letter that you posted from Alex Greenwich, the homosexual uh, member of the New South Wales Parliament, who was one of the leaders of the Yes campaign for same-sex marriage during the, the 2017 plebiscite. He was one of the key activists in the so-called Australian marriage equality. So he is asking the New South Wales taxpayer to foot Gary Burns's bills to you and your lawyers and to the court system. Uh, for, for what reason? I, I mean, the, the guy has lost, and yet Alex Greenwich thinks that because he's a, a gay activist, he has a proprietary right to taxpayers' money. I mean, how does this work? Well, it's it's completely outrageous, law, and obviously uh, if the state of New South Wales did stump up and cover those costs, uh, I, I would uh, benefit from that. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So I just think it's completely unfair on the taxpayer of New South Wales mm -hmm. to be put in a position where they are treated as a gay TM, um, which yeah. is what the LGBT activists seem to think that uh, taxpayer funds are all about and that they should be stumping up to cover the costs of an LGBT activist who has lodged hundreds of complaints uh, under the anti-discrimination system over the last two decades. He is the most litigious uh, person in New South Wales under the Anti-Discrimination Act. And in fact, without Gary Burns, the particular provision uh, of homosexual vilification laws in New South Wales would almost never be used. He's almost mm. the sole complainer in the history of New South Wales, this law really should be relabeled the Gary Burns Act. Well, well uh, on that law, yeah, you've, right. you've got some, um, some you know, help coming finally uh, in the form of um, some political cover by Mark Latham, the New South Wales One Nation leader. Um, it, it amazes me that the Liberal Party down there doesn't seem to have done anything to try and amend the law to, to try and stop this nonsense going on. But but Mark Latham is trying to bring about some law reform. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, look, I'm very grateful to Mark. Um, I think he's shown great courage uh, and very effective political leadership in the New South Wales Parliament. So he's brought a bill in that will essentially force the Anti-Discrimination Board uh, to dismiss vexatious complaints. So at the moment, the board has discretion uh, with regards to the vexatious complaints, they can choose to keep going with them, um, which is what they've been doing. But it's only because of the pressure that uh, me and my legal team have been able to bring against Gary Burns and, and Mark Latham's bill, which I think was the most important element, that the board has now finally admitted that Burns' complaints are vexatious. And it did that in relation to his three complaints against Israel Folau. Yep. Uh, and I'm increasingly hopeful that they will make the same finding in relation to his most recent complaint against me. Um, the board's in a bit of a difficult pickle at the moment because um, on one hand, for seven years, they have consistently ignored the evidence I've presented that Burns is lodging complaints to bankrupt me. And if you go to my website and read uh, the article I wrote, I've quoted numerous emails where Burns has said he yeah. wants to bankrupt me, throw my wife and children into the gutter, etc. I, I read uh, that. He's saying that you're going to be out in your undies. Um, I mean, all these, you know, terrible threats. Uh, this, he was quite transparent in, in what his aim towards you was, and that was to ruin you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the board has known about these emails for seven years, mm -hmm. um, and it's not that these emails were first sent seven years. There's been consistent communication like that. I don't know why Burns sends me these emails, but he does. He can't help himself. For seven years, he's been sending emails like that. The board not only ignores that evidence, it has removed that evidence from the files it sends to NCAT. But in the mm -hmm. case of Israel Folau, they've come out now and said that Burns is vexatious. So they put themselves in this in this pickle because they – they have now essentially admitted that they were wrong in relation to what they did with Burns um, for seven so, years. Uh, so what, 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 why isn't anyone from the from politics, from the government of New South Wales, the, the Gladys Berejiklian government, uh, their Attorney General, why are they not acknowledging the injustice that's been done to you and, and why are they not looking at law reform? Uh, well, I think th there's two aspects to this question. Firstly, I am increasingly hopeful that Mark Latham's bill 
uh, will be passed by the New South Wales Parliament. And I did see uh, Damien Perrottet answer a question for Mark Latham in Parliament recently, where Damien Perrottet, and he's a minister in the government. Yeah. I can he's see. not the Attorney General, though, is he? He's no, he's not the Attorney General, but he was answering on behalf of the Attorney General, and he is a minister uh, for small business. He mm -hmm. stated that he was concerned about the state of affairs, and I think um, you know, that's time. a very, very hopeful sign that some positive but, action... Wouldn't, wouldn't it be better, rather than um, the bill that Mark Latham is uh, proposing, which, which essentially stops vexatious complaints, that's a good thing, why not overhaul these laws altogether um, and, and take away this... I mean, preferably abolish them. I don't know why we need anti-discrimination laws. I mean, I mean, civil society should be able to sort this out. Obviously, we don't want to discriminate against people on, on race and religion and these sort of things and, and be nasty to our fellow citizens. But these laws are just used as a weapon uh, by activists, essentially to try and silence others. They, they seem to serve no good purpose. Uh, at least take the subjective clauses out of these, these bills, you know, that allow people to lodge legal action if they feel offended or their feelings are hurt or they feel like they've been vilified. I mean, these are very subjective things that can mean almost anything uh, and are used as weapons against people like yourself and myself uh, to try and shut down free speech. Um, isn't that the sort of reform we really need? And, and, and you know, has, has Mark Latham offered a, a view on, you know, going a bit further more in that direction? Well, look, I think Mark is uh, working... On, you know, on the principle that the politics is the art of the possible. And at the moment, mm. he is trying to achieve what he can, and I think he's doing that very effectively, and I'm very grateful for that. But you are 100% right. Mm. The well, which means that there's a lack of courage um, on the conservative side of politics to really tackle these laws, which have been set up really to, to squash free speech. That's what they're really about. Oh, absolutely. And well, this one, it's not just conservative politics. I think it is conservative think tanks, mm. um, conservative action groups in general, you'll find very few of them are prepared to come out and say, as a policy position, these organisations need to be abolished. Um, now, mm. look, I think it's one thing for politicians like Mark Latham working in a current parliament to try and achieve something, but we actually need conservative think tanks to start coming out and saying, mm. as a matter of policy, these organisations should be bulldozed, and they should be. Yeah. The, the solution is to bulldoze the Human Rights Commission. In I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, look, I was, board. I, I was briefly part of a political party called the Australian Conservatives, and it was our policy under Cory Bernardi to abolish uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission and the state-based equivalents because I, I've never seen them stand up for human rights. They never stand up for the human right of freedom of speech. Uh, and they never stand up for human rights for the unborn, but that's another story. So totally with you there, Bernie. And um, look, I think, you know, as you say, it is the art of the possible. Good on Mark Latham. At least he's doing something and it's shining a light on just how ridiculous these laws and these kangaroo courts called human rights commissions and, and the various tribunals that are part of the legal architecture, uh, that that's what they are. They're kangaroo courts and um, they serve no good purpose. Mate, um, before I let you go, um, I... I informed the, the viewers um, just before you came, came on that I'm facing my own uh, trials and tribulations, this time in the uh, Queensland Human Rights Commission. Uh, two drag queens, Johnny Valkyrie, uh, a, a woman who's presenting as a man, and uh, another drag queen that goes by the name of Diamond Goodrim, uh, who were involved in drag queens' story time to children in the Brisbane City Council Library in January. They're taking me to the Queensland Human Rights Commission because they uh, uh, are offended by what I wrote in a blog post in January. Uh, what's your advice to me, mate? Uh, my advice is don't back down, Lyle. And uh, I think there is some other good advice, which does not come directly from me, but I followed it. Um, and it came from the Canadian columnist, Mark Stein. And that mm. is that uh, fight the system. Um, you should not ever go into these battles accepting the battlegrounds uh, or the battlefield that these people want to play on. The whole entire system is a bogus and a sham uh, and it is simply outrageous that anyone such as yourself should have to justify why you express views 
about what happens in Brisbane City Council libraries in the lead up to a Brisbane City Council election. This is clearly a political issue um, and we have freedom of political communication in Australia and so the entire system which is predicated on the assumption that you should have to even account for your views is wrong. So my advice is to fight not just the complaints but the system itself. The system is a sham. Well, well Bernie, th thank you for that. I couldn't agree more and very much as a result of the inspiration I've gained from watching you over the years. Uh, I'm determined just to do that. And um, just this week, I've published a blog post prior to my um, being forced to attend a conciliation on the 13th of August. And I've said, I, I won't be apologising. I won't be amending my blog. That's all on the record now. So um, like you, mate, uh, I'm fighting the system, but you've gone before us and I really appreciate that. And I know everyone watching uh, this show also appreciates all that you've done. You've shone a light on something. Uh, the battle is far from won and probably many more of us are going to have to go through these trials, but I think eventually we're going to see this corrupt, bogus system uh, fall over and free speech restored in our great nation of Australia. So, Bernie, thanks very much for being with us. Well, can I, I just would like to add yeah. one, <clears throat> one additional thing just on this. It is very important that people get behind you. Uh, it's very difficult to fight these things by yourself. I've been very mm -hmm fortunate and extremely grateful for the thousands and thousands of Australians mm. who've donated, encouraged me, prayed for me, assisted me. Uh, it is not a one-man fight. You need a team, mm. and I would encourage everyone to get behind you because we all have a vested interest in seeing you succeed and defend freedom. No, thanks, mate. I, I really appreciate that. And, um, and I know I've got great support and I'm very thankful for the Human Rights Law Alliance in, in Canberra that are, are behind me. And I know you've had great legal help uh, as well. And, um, you know, thanks to good people uh, who are willing to fight the fight, um, we all can together. So good on you, mate. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Lyle. Well, welcome back to The Lyle Shelton Show. It's great to have your company. Well, my next guest is a, a good friend and the founder of this incredibly fantastically exciting new news service the good source news uh, dave pello welcome to the lyle shelton show on the good source news thank you very much my handsome friend how are you <laughs> flattery will get you everywhere dave i'm i'm well mate um look this is a very exciting initiative and i'm very excited to be part of this i've watched your journey over a number of years uh, through the church and state conferences that you've run uh, and, and even prior to that through um, I think the church and state interviews that you were posting on, on YouTube you had um, some very impressive guests you've been a pioneer in this alternative media space for years now and uh, now you're you've launched out with the good source um, tell me about your hopes and aspirations uh, for this new venture uh, so what I what I've always wanted to do is uh, and with the church and state summit uh, i like when we gather and that's specifically for a christian audience uh mm -hmm. whereas the good source isn't it's for, for everyone who's a fan of of truth and good public policy not afraid of facts and uh, uh, no fondness for political correctness mm -hmm. um but when i you know was doing the church and state summits um i, I uh, tried to make it a showcase not just of good ideas but of uh, good organisations that were on the coalface and and um, not for profit and and sympathetic organisations that people needed to hear about and and to raise the profile uh, of them um, and so one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do with the good source is is likewise to raise the profile of of people like yourself now for uh, five years you were the managing director of the Australian Christian Lobby. You had a great budget and a great team of, of people with you, um, but your voice is just as important now, although lacking a lot of important resources. Um, so what I can bring to the table for, you know, who knows how many, 10 or, or more people, um, is, is that ability to execute, to produce mm -hmm. shows, um, and, and what we need to do with the biggest audience possible mm -hmm. is essentially start funding that to bring on extra production mm -hmm. staff so that we can um, collaborate um, and, and combine those abilities to work together. Now, that doesn't mean um, consolidate or, or conglomerate. 
I love big words. Um, what it what it means is that we're a bunch of independent voices who are working together, and disagreement is welcome and fine. Um, we don't have to have uniformity in theology or policy. Um, but this is where, you know what, we don't need to bring in the Greens to have a balanced conversations because they get to dominate the conversation in mainstream media. They get a whole taxpayer-funded broadcaster. This yeah. is the balance to that conversation. Yeah. And look, that's the exciting thing about this. With the technology that you and I are using now, okay, it may not be yep. quite as schmick as um, the ABC and their $1 billion a year organisation and they can fund shows like Q&A, but... You know, people like you and I, and, and I think many conservatives and, and Christians uh, and just people of goodwill are, are sick of the one-sided uh, commentary that we're getting and, and, and the, the reporting with a, a very biased one-sided agenda, uh, a yeah. cultural Marxist, we're using some, some jargon here, but um, we're not being well served uh, with the truth through our mainstream media. So this is a fledgling attempt to circumvent that and, and to disrupt uh, that and to, to give a platform to, uh, you know, evidence-based um, news and commentary. Yeah. Now, now you, you've got some really impressive thinkers as part of the, the Good Source community. Um, talk, talk us through some of the people that um, are going to be on this platform. I mean, these are people who have already made a name for themselves in their own right uh, yeah. in for a mainstream media. Yeah, well, this is one of the things. Um, I guess the, the appropriate word is, is curation. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not censoring by any way, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is curate a platform of of some of uh, Australia's leading conservative thinkers. And and there's other leading conservative thinkers who aren't on the platform and, mm -hmm. and they're probably welcome. So it's not an exclusive definitive yeah. list. But um, and by the same token, there's probably a whole bunch of, of people who are aspiring um, and, mm -hmm. and not quite there yet that their voice needs development and, and further work. So... One of the things that we're trying to achieve with this is um, financial viability. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the thing that right-wing conservatives struggle with. It seems that the left have all the money. Uh, mm -hmm. They certainly have all the taxpayer funding. Um, but they have, you know, George Soros and, and who knows mm -hmm. who else pouring funds into organisations like GetUp that can do incredibly uh, well-financed campaigns. Um, with with massive amounts of money coming from who knows where and most of it overseas, um, what we have to do is is work together smarter and harder. So uh, the important probably part is that the people who come to the good source, such as yourself, already have a developed um, and and well established audience. Because one of the key principles of the good source is that each of us promotes all of us. Uh, and so while you bring your audience uh, to the Good Source platform, uh, you get the benefit of nine or ten other conservatives with their own developed audiences now all promoting you, which is a so fairly some good... Some of those, um, yeah, no, that, that's right. And, and I think bringing it all together in, in, under some sort of united umbrella, yeah. uh, we're better together rather than being fragmented. You've yeah. got some pretty impressive people as part of this now. You, you've got... Um, You've got a member of parliament, uh, George Christensen. Um, Correct. Got James, James McPherson. If anyone's followed his Twitter feed over the last five years, that's been very entertaining. Um, few cut through yep. like names, and his articles are amazing. Katrina Ocatel, um, former uh, vice president of the Liberal Party uh, down in Victoria. Um, Marika. Also, Rankin. also federally, she was the vice president. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yep. Mareka, uh, political posting mama, um, did a lot on the whole safe schools involved in the marriage campaign with myself and others. Um, Mark Powell, um, who have I missed, Dave? Uh, Mark Powell, he's a great thinker, a Presbyterian minister in Sydney who writes a lot for the Spectator and other blogs. Um, these people are, you know, some of the most bravest voices <laughs> in the country they are. saying no one else is. Well, this is the uh, website as of uh, the weekend. Oh, um, yeah, Bill Muhlenberg there, of course. Uh, Bill Muhlenberg, Bernard Gaynor, who, uh, yes, who we've just who had, had on the show today, today as well, yeah. hmm. um, James, yeah, um, and you said Marika, of course. Yeah. Um, so we've got guest writers as well who who different different things. Uh, it, it might be it's a great great looking website too, Dave. You've done a fantastic job on the production of it there. The Good Source News dot com dot no dot news. Good Source dot news. Goodsource.news and it's S A U C E, very Australian source. That's, we love that's correct. 
Um, yeah, there's um, there's more coming all the time to uh, to the oh, this is everybody there. The little picture I should have just gone off that instead of looking through the articles. Um, look there. Let, let's have a sneak. Well, what a bunch and, of deplorables! What a bunch of deplorables, Dave. I mean, a, a great basket. <laughs> this is the basket right there. Um, so, if you want, we can actually make a, uh, a announcement, which may not be ready by the time this goes live, but uh, yeah, your viewers can, break, can break have the show, Dave, eh? is that break some news on the Lyle Shelton show. Uh, the, the next person being added to the, uh, the weekly shows that are being produced by The Good Source is Corin Barraclough. Corin, so, I've heard that. I don't know much about her. If you explain her to me. Well, um, she is a journalist who has spent over 20 years uh, working in uh, London and New York and Sydney. Uh, she's lived the high life and, and done lots of, of uh, you know, the, the, worldly, the worldly things with all the celebrities and gala parties and, and just the, the high elite Did lifestyle. Did I see her on one of your Pillow Talk shows recently? Yeah, she was yeah. Just, on, um, just on the last one with, with Pauline Hanson and, okay. and she's... Yeah. And she might have been on the one with Mark Latham and, name, and name dropping well. there, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Tell us all the big guests you've had. <laughs> all, I've, all I can get is Dave Pello, but uh, you know, you get Mark oh. Latham. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's just a bit harsh. All you can get. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, yeah, well, that's what, um, that's Corin yeah, there next Corin to me there. in in that thumbnail. Yep, got it there. Um, um, and and yeah, so she's uh, she's we've got a big interest in mm. family law. Um, now yeah, I'll be doing really a special important. interview with her myself, um, but her show, look, this is such a big area. Um, mm -hmm. There's a family mm -hmm. law inquiry going on at the moment in Australia. Uh, it's such a big area. It's something I've wanted to sink my teeth into, but it's very complex um, and it, it's not a, a black and white issue. So I love sinking my teeth into the big issues like uh, mm -hmm. like you do. Um, but family law is complex and, the, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's hard to say, God has a certain position, um, black and white, on any particular strand of of the various policies and, and ways we could approach it. Um, but Corin is going to make her weekly show all about it. And so Fantastic. there'll be an ongoing yeah. conversation. Um, and she's a specialist in this area of um, of research. So, yeah, that's... Um, that's awesome. Look, there's, there's nothing more important than to have the conversation around... Uh, families and the reason why we have a crisis in family law is because of the chronic breakdown of, of mothers and fathers and marriage and mm. and we know and, and I don't know from what perspective Corin's coming but but Dave you and I have discussed this uh, in the social science research is overwhelming that you know where a mum and a dad stay together and raise their biological children those kids mm. do better on every score it is irrefutable uh, science and yet yeah. you're not allowed to talk about this in in, in parliaments, yeah. conservative politicians won't even raise the idea of preferencing marriage between a man and a woman in public policy because that is, you know, seen as hate speech now. And this is how ridiculous yep. things have got. So, mate, all power to you if, if you and Well, Brian in that vein, uh, one of her big concerns is parental alienation through mm -hmm. um, separation and divorce proceedings. Uh, and that disproportionately affects men, but it also yeah. uh, affects women as well. So it's she's children. looking... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Of course, to be alienated from your parents yeah, um, yeah. through a designed policy, as we yeah. saw in the 2017 yeah. uh, non-binding postal survey that uh, changed <laughs> the undefinition of marriage. Um, I love, you, love your, your refusal to bow to PC uh, nomenclature, David. Well done. Mate, um, tell me, what has driven you all these years to, to be a pioneer in this uh, alternative media space? Um, there's been few, you know, there, there's other, other people doing things, but you, you've become one of the, the key voices in the nation. What's what's driven you? I know you've done it at great personal sacrifice um, because you obviously believe in it passionately, but what drives mm. Dave Pello? Uh, well, I got involved in party politics uh, gradually and incrementally. It wasn't ever, hey, I want to be prime minister. Just I might go along to the local branch and can someone like me even do that? So it started from very, very low ignorance. Uh, very low information, um, which is at conversely high ignorance. But, um, you know, my family wasn't into politics at all. We didn't discuss it. I just know whenever a Labor Prime Minister came on TV, Dad changed channels. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, there was no discussion. We didn't even hear the other side, uh, which is, 
you know, not the way I teach people to do it now, but um, just don't watch TV at all. Um, watch the good source. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. actually if just a little side note. One of the reasons you want to get behind the good source is because we're going, we're, we're building towards why we want to build the production team is because we want to replace the the six o'clock news every night. We want to do a nightly broadcast for you, and that's going to take a big enterprise, but we can do it together. Um, mm. And and so going through the the political game, I, I ended up, you know, campaigning and campaign director and uh, achieving some things there and just feeling uh, frustrated with the way things were at that stage. And uh, I joined the um, state executive of the Family First Party mm. and um, voted as, you know, one of the people who got a say that, yeah, let's throw our lot in with uh, Cory Bernardi's Conservatives. Mm. And um, I just let my yeah. membership lapse oh, then because, <laughs> yeah, well, um, it didn't end uh, very well, but that's another story. Um, well, we, did, we did the right thing, but, uh, yeah, it's another story. Keep going, Dave. What what drives Dave? Is, yeah. <laughs> So one particular one particular federal election, um, it was very very close. And and Sunday morning, because uh, in Australia we always have our elections on a Saturday, very smart. Mm. And then Sunday morning, the counting hadn't indicated yet who was going to win. And and so churches were, uh, and my church was no different. Um, we were putting up our hand and asking God to intervene and make sure the. Uh, you know, the outcome was going to be righteous and, and for the benefit of, of the nation. But it it broke my heart. It became stark, like flashing lights right in my face that most of the people were putting their hand up because they were concerned about the future of the nation. Most of the people were, were raising their hands towards heaven. And I'm like, well, I was helping yesterday. Uh, where were you? Yeah. And I believe Holy Spirit um taught me something about politics from the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, just in my heart as I was there in church that you know, two religious people walked past the need of their neighbour on their way to a religious duty, on the way to the temple. Mm. And then some random, who the, who the Jews who were hearing this story before we got to hear it, the people who heard this first looked down their nose at people from the province of Samaria. Um, they thought they weren't very religious uh, or had a, had a false kind of uh, understanding of God. Um, but it was a Samaritan who saw this person, this random stranger on the side of the road, and treated him like a neighbour and treated him with unconditional love and allowed himself to be inconvenienced mm -hmm. and interrupted from what he was wanting yeah, to be doing mm -hmm. for the welfare of his neighbour. And I just thought, you know, how easy is it for us to love 25 million neighbours with one day's effort on election day? Every three years, how much does it cost us really to take an effort, be interrupted, be inconvenienced? Yeah. Uh, and like the Good Samaritan, not only in, inject ourselves with time and money, but actually take a long-term interest in the outcome, which is also what the Good Samaritan did. And, yeah. and so it really upset me that... My church, people from my tribe, um, you know, Christians generally um, were mowing the lawn and, and doing other things that distracted them from being able to help their neighbours on Saturday. And I yeah. thought rather than getting angry or, or frustrated, I need to be part of the solution. Well, mate, and you, so you that brings I... us to today, yeah, um, which is well, mate, information and education yeah, and absolutely. news. Well, well, you and I you know, speak at um, events all the time where there's often Q&A sec sessions and, and it's often older people um, who, who turn up to these things and, and that's great. Uh, but they are frustrated because they see mm. our culture and our society declining. I was at a forum like this just last week and, um, you know, I, I sympathise with them, but mm. uh, unless we actually do things and get involved, get our hands dirty, as you described, like like the Good Samaritan, inconvenience ourselves. And, and there's nothing more dirtier, unfortunately, in modern society than, than politics. Mm. Uh, look, you know, he helping the poor and the, the vulnerable, obviously that involves getting your hands dirty, but getting involved in politics is particularly dirty. And um, I, I really admire what you're doing, Dave, because I know it's not just a case of setting up commentary for the sake of commentary, but it's totally. informing people with a view mm -hmm. to, to activism. And I think that's where you're coming from as, as I am. Yeah. Look, if all people did was be a be a mum, be a plumber, be a teacher, be a student, uh, be an accountant, do your job for three years. But then when it comes election time, 
uh, have the presence of mind to at least put the same amount of effort into choosing your local representative as you do when it's time to replace your fridge. At least put that much effort into it. You wouldn't take a how to, like uh, your, your political party or anybody else's recommendation on buying a fridge. You'd compare yeah. a couple of models, you'd find the best value, um, and you'd put two or three hours effort into the research, catalogs and online looking, and you'd yeah. go out and, and inspect them um, person to person. That's all I'm saying. Just yep. surely the future of our 25 million neighbours, not self-interest, mm. but surely the the in, the future of your 25 million, this is helping the poor, this is helping Absolutely. the vulnerable, and, yep. and this is how we and, do and it. I, I don't have I to even be an that, activist. Just well, care on election day. Yeah, definitely do that. I, I would say, you know, go a step further and, and join a political yes. party. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go and sit at all the branch meetings. Sometimes they can be very boring, but at least be a member because that gives you mm. an elevated status and, and a say in pre-selections in determining who actually, you know, gets to put themselves up uh, on a ballot paper and eventually end up with a seat in parliament. And uh, yeah. it, it's it's very democratic in Australia, particularly on the conservative side of politics. And um, I think things have got so bad, it's reckless yep. of us now not to be involved. We just can't leave yep. it to the party machines anymore. I, I totally agree. Yeah, that's and, and a very, very smart second step. Um, yeah. But the, the first but, yeah, step is... The first, yeah. Well, the first step the, the is... The first step um, is promise to never take a how-to-vote card ever again. Um, first, do enough research is, to decide for yourself. Absolutely. First step is they watch the good source and then you'll be motivated to of course. ensure that your vote is uh, is an informed one. Mate, I think it's exciting. Look, I love watching Sky News and, and, and a lot of the commentary we see on Sky News is, is stuff that many of us as conservatives and, and Christians would agree with, probably 90% of it. Um, I think there's definitely a space for, for this sort of commentary here. We're probably a little bit more honed in our, um, in our beliefs. Uh, but... We can't just watch commentary. Um, use it to get informed and then, and then yep. activate it. And, and if, if what we do here is just become, uh, you know, talking heads uh, like Sky News, um, then uh, I think we'll have missed the boat. But if we can spur people to activism because yep. uh, we've got a fight on our hands for our country, and I know that's yep. what animates you, Dave, and, and um, myself and the others that are involved uh, in this wonderful new service. So I think it's really exciting, mate. If we can, if, if this can be something like, you know, the Daily Wire in the US, which has become phenomenally popular, yes. we can do an Australian version of that with our own Australian yeah. flavour. I'm sure that's where you're wanting to take this. Ignorance is a liability we can solve together. Yeah, there you go. Well, mate, with that, um, thanks very much for, for being part of uh, the Lyle Shelton Show on The Good Source. And uh, I'm really Thank looking you for forward having to me. It's a privilege. Learning. Uh, well, thanks for creating the platform, mate. Um, mm. And I uh, look forward to seeing where this journey goes. Thanks, Lyle. Well, thanks for being with us on the Lyle Shelton Show again this week. Uh, I didn't want to leave without giving a plug for my new book, which I'm sure many of you have already seen. It's called, I kid you not, Notes from 20 Years in the Trenches of the Culture Wars. And I have some exciting news. The first edition of this has completely sold out. A thousand copies have just flown out the door uh, in the space of about three or four weeks. Uh, it's blown me away. I did not know when I sat down to write this book over a year ago whether it would have any interest to anyone else. I knew that I had to do it. I wanted to tell the stories of what's, what I've observed um, through my days in local government, uh, in the Toowoomba City Council fighting brothels and strip clubs, uh, a dishonest sewage water drinking campaign, uh, through to my days at Australian Christian Lobby where we were activists for human rights for the unborn, involved in the Indigenous recognition debate, and then, of course, that big marriage campaign in 2017. And uh, I chart so many of the behind-the-scenes battles of the culture wars um, from 20 years of, of, of being one person in the trenches. And uh, there's been many other fine people that I've worked alongside, other organisations. I know I haven't done them justice in this book, but I wanted to write down these stories, and uh, I've done it. And uh, as I say, the first edition is sold out. This is the second edition on the imprint page. It says second edition, and I'm excited about that. And I hope you might be encouraged to, to get your copy. I think every Australian needs to know what's been going on, why we've ended up with so much harmful and bad public policy that's hurting vulnerable people, particularly women and children in our nation, and it's got to stop. I spill the beans on how this happens, on the failure of leadership, what goes on in politics to facilitate so much uh, badness in our public discourse. So please get your copy. 
It's at uh, lyleshelton.com.au. Uh, you can uh, click on the Buy My Book link there, and I'd love it if you could grab a copy of this, give it to your friends, and uh, help get this truth bomb out into the nation. Well, that's it for the Lyle Shelton Show for this week. Uh, thanks so much for being with me. I really appreciate your company and join us again next time right here at The Good Source. The Lyle Shelton Show is a production of The Good Source hosted by Lyle Shelton. To watch, listen to or read more content without the SJW PC fact filter, visit goodsource.news, good S-A-U-C-E dot news. Become a Good Source supporter for exclusive access to live and unedited interview recordings, including the conversations before and after the show.